this right. Two holes. Welcome everyone to the Dobbs Ferry regular meeting for Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. Do I have a motion to open the meeting? Trustee Nell, second, um, Trustee Patino. All in favor? Meeting's open. We have, please rise for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to so the first item on the agenda is the public hearing it's the continuation of a public hearing to consider the application of 115 Broadway uh, to Cabrini to add a new parking lot on their property so who's here to Okay. Yeah, you're right. Um, okay, we'll wait a few minutes. Okay. So let's do. I have the appointments. Um, I'm going to appoint Yair Rosencrantz as chair of the AHRB. He's currently uh, a member of the AHRB, which he's going to replace uh, now Trustee Patino as the chair of the AHRB. And I'm also appointing Dale Greenwald as first alternate member of the AHRB, each for a term of three years. That doesn't require a vote, that's just my appointment. Right, Charlene? Right. Okay. It's a statutory board. It's a statutory board, so you may have a motion. What, do you need a motion? Morally, do we need a motion? Do I need a motion? Yes, it's a statutory board. It's a statutory board appointed? Yes. Does it, you mean? Actually, he's already on the board, so I'm just appointing him as chair. No, but okay. Dale. But Dale, I'm appointing as the first alternate. To the? HRB. HRB. HRB is in the code. Yes, it's yeah. a statutory. Doing it. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> is, is there a motion to appoint <laughs> Dale Greenwald as alternate no. member of the AHRB? No. But Trustee Patino, is there a second? Trustee Casal. All in favor? So that... So, may, so be it, Dale is now the first alternate member. Are uh, we ready? Come on up. So I think you were going to do a, some type of a 3D demonstration for us. Exactly right. Perfect. So let's see that. Great. So while Ralph sets up, uh, thank you for the opportunity for uh, pushing us back on the agenda. Um, again, for the record, Taylor Palmer with Cutting Fader. I'm um, joined by Ralph Perry. Our traffic and poultry are joined uh, by our <coughs> of the Green Westchester as well. Um, as the mayor mentioned, we are going to be presenting uh, some visuals uh, that were requested at the last meeting. Just by way of brief background while Ralph uh, sets that up. Uh, we are before you for a continued review of the site plan. The application has been referred uh, over to uh, the planning board for comment. Additionally, we have uh, received comments from the Westchester County Planning Board on referral. We are adjacent to a state road. Uh, so the application was referred over to county uh, pursuant to general municipal law 239. Uh, those comments were received uh, on the 24th. So Ralph will address uh, those specific comments, specific to stormwater, uh, parking, which is already provided for uh, on our property, uh, and as well as uh, any correspondence uh, with the DOT. For those uh, in the public this evening, uh, the applicant uh, was previously was before the board on the 14th. Uh, January 14th, when the public hearing was originally uh, opened for the matter, uh, and again, we were here on the, uh, the 28th. Uh, for those uh, that were unable to appear at the last site visit, there was also a site visit to the premises on the 27th to go through our proposed off-street uh, parking design. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, the board did specifically request that we prepare uh, some type of a visual simulation, 3D modeling. Uh, so at this point, without further ado, I will have uh, Ralph please go through the benefit of the board and those in the public. Uh, a design that shows the site set down in the hill. You're all familiar with the location of uh, the parking area. Um, it will also show um, some aerial uh, photos of what it looks like, although many of us won't be flying over the building. Uh, we do have a cool Google Earthy uh, component. So, with that, thank you. Can you make it the whole screen? 
Can you make the picture the whole screen so you don't have that background? <coughs> Can you maximize it? Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I apologize, but uh, not apologize, but we've done some uh, pictures and videos of the 3D rendering. But if you want to see any uh, images beyond that, I'll have to load my hook my computer up to your monitor in order to do that because it's a specific program called AutoCAD Infraverse. So that's how we created these models. So this is looking from. The, parking, the lower parking lot towards Broadway, and you can see that, the, as we had mentioned previously, the parking lot itself and the tops of cars are sitting below the level of Broadway here. Um, this is, okay, I'm going to stretch it out again, apologize. Here we go. So this is looking from, kind of like an aerial view, looking from St. Christopher's towards the site. And those trees would remain? The, this tree is the existing Mars tree. This one, these smaller ones are the landscaping from the landscape plan. As you mentioned previously, we wanted to add some shrubs in this area here. That's what, uh, at our sidewalk, where the edge, you mentioned a lot of us to add some shrubs there. We've done that. I also have the landscaping plan which shows that. I wasn't able to submit it, but we, do, we have it on the landscape. Can you, uh, I'm sorry, to, but this, this I think is the right picture to ask the question. What's the drop? from the sidewalk to the the highest level of the actual parking surface? Uh, about nine feet. It's going from 114 on the roadway to approximately 106 at the parking surface. So it's I guess that's eight feet. But, um, and then the, the, the initial height of the shrubs that are between the sidewalk right, and the so we can go back there, that's the these shrubs here, the initial height would be approximately three feet. They mature somewhere between five to seven. So eventually they will mature. Um, their mature height will be within the fence line. And this is looking from the driveway down in towards St. Christopher's and the Broadway on the left here. And those trees in the back to the left. These are the existing trees along the property line that we said we were re we were retaining at this point. We're going to try to retain. Design that their size and scale are approximate what's out there right now. Uh, the, you know they're not the exact same species, but the height of them and the scale of their uh, leaf, um, the spread on those leaves is approximately what's out there now. Same thing with the existing large sycamore tree. Again, not. Our model, we don't have certain trees available. We use what we can based on the model. So. Trying to get this to run the video. <coughs> okay, here we go. Let me try clearing the whole thing for you. All right, I'm going to have to run the video separately. Video image uh, of the model as you're driving northbound on Broadway. This is what you would see from a driver's design perspective. Uh, the, the, speed limit, the speed at which this driver is going is only about five to seven miles an hour. So obviously, you know, the, the driver will be. Now, this is switching to the southbound perspective. As you can see, we added the shrubs in this area. Can you do that again? Can you play that again? Sure. I have several versions, but I will play this. Uh, I have a one from your perspective with somebody walking on Broadway and then one that kind of does a flyover of the second. And 
these are all based on the, the, uh, the model that we generated, the 3D model. You see that shrub, that line of shrubs again to soften that view from the from the driveway coming in and the line of shrubs behind the uh, existing fence line. Play next one. Yeah. So this is a walking view as somebody's walking down. And again, this is um, from a perspective of high height, somebody walking, kind of looking towards the building, walking northbound and then we'll flip it and it will flip and go southbound. And, you know. and as you can see from the, uh, the walking perspective, you can see the river in the background, but there is a lot of trees towards the back of the property, which be looking through those trees. If you'd like to see uh, different perspectives, I'd have to look up my computer with the program, so that's up to you. What does everybody else think? You want to see more? Are you satisfied with what you're seeing? Okay. Am I counting correctly and you have five spaces that they face Broadway and then the other ones are divided in both sides? I'm sorry. I, 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 five parking spaces are the ones facing Broadway? In this lot, 25 parking spaces. Five are the ones facing Broadway? Or facing Broadway? You're talking about these five spaces here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then how many on each other side? Just how are they distributed? There's A little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Can you just speak up a little bit? Oh, sorry. Uh, we had to we had to force parallel spaces to the building because to make up for the net loss of the one uh, access, accessible aisle space here, and the net loss of the three parking spaces for the emergency connections. So there, this is a net balance in this area. Any other, <clears throat> any other questions by the board? This is a public hearing, so certainly the public. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Just to the, I wanted to show you the landscape plan, just to show you that what we had, uh, as the board had requested, we had placed a uh, row of shrubs in this area along the uh, existing driveway to soften that view from the driveway to the parking lot and vice versa. Okay. Do I have other <coughs> questions, Vinny, but not per se about the 3D? No, rendering. just about this whole. Okay, you can talk okay. about anything. Well, we well we are speaking in terms of the landscaping. When we did the tour, there was um, a few trees that they are on the property of um, San Christopher, and we discussed the distance that the structure will begin and how it will protect actually. So, so those trees were on uh, not necessarily on San Christopher. They were along the fence line. The fence line is several. Uh, San Christopher is built their fence, so if you can get into the property. Mm -hmm. But those of these trees, this line of trees right in this area here that we're saving. Uh, one of the reasons why we had rotated the parking lot within that corner to the north was to save those trees so that we weren't destruct, uh, disrupting their uh, root structure. And so what is the distance currently um, for the construction? Approximately 20 feet from those trees with the curb line. That was to, again, to preserve those trees and not affect their root structures. How many trees are there currently? that those circles on these trees were where I was saying we want to stay out of the trees, taking the structure out of those circles to preserve those trees. And that's the, that was the root zone that we were working on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I had a couple of follow-ups to our conversation last time. I looked um, again at the parking study analysis, and it seems to me if we add the 25 spaces you're proposing that the majority of time there's going to be like a significant excess of free and open spots um, just to make sure that during a very limited period of time um, that everyone has an available spot that's convenient for them. Well, I'm trying to understand. I mean, I guess, so I guess, I guess for me, it's like I'm, I'm having trouble reconciling your own calculations. So what I had said previously was that we we designed for a peak situation, and that's how we have to design because that peak situation is the turnover in the afternoon of the uh, the different shifts, the nursing shifts. Right. Because of those different shifts, the nurses need to be logged in and signed in before the next before the nurse that's on duty can leave. Of course. So that's the reason why. And then we add a um, safety factor, as we do in all traffic calculations. We add a reserve and a factor to it to make sure that we're accounting for any additional um, unforeseen circumstances. And that's typical of any of the traffic impacts that are designed in the parking so, so we had calculated in our analysis based on, uh, I believe it was 15, was the actual deficit. Uh, we looked at, again, the aerial photographs, which we had taken was showing the 19 car deficit on the aerial photographs that were taken for the project. And we took those numbers and we added the safety factor to, that, to the overall, so that's how we came up to the 25 in our study. Now, I also wonder why you didn't take, like, you know, the highest and the lowest and exclude them and look more at like a median number for the, when you have the deficit so that you wouldn't end up with 25 and maybe you end up with 15 parking spots instead of you know maximizing um, it for the one half hour period that had a 15 deficit. 
if, if I may, uh, on, the, on that question, um, there were also comments from the public, those that have worked at the Cabrini, and those that experienced these operating times day in and day out. So part of what we're representing here, you know, again, I'm sure an applicant would love to come before this board in the future when they need parking and can't provide it, and say, hey, it's only during the peak that we get away with this maybe during a, a regular non-peak hour. I, I certainly would like to make that justification as a, another application. Here, we're trying to make sure that this has been done, and I understand that this has already been a reduced proposal over what was originally considered to account for preserving those trees on the property. And again, existing conditions here. We're not adding any new changes to Green. There's no new programming. There's no new anything. It's just existing conditions, and this is to help satisfy that need that I think the public and those that have worked at Cabrini, and again, the traffic study goes to show. So it's really a, a composite of all of those components and really tries to work in ensuring that there's no visual or other impacts, um, as we showed in the 3D design, um, and as otherwise uh, presented here, it really is a, a de minimis zoning compliant parking lot. So this, this lot is also fully compliant with zoning with its setbacks and, and otherwise. Um, so we tried to make sure that this accounts for that with additional screening, preserving the trees, and ultimately uh, making sure that we get site visits and the like to ensure that all visual, uh, potential visual impacts uh, were mitigated by this, this proposal. Yeah, except that I had somebody go there today between 2.30 and 3.30, which is your peak time on both days that you did the anecdotal parking survey, and there were 13 open spaces on the north side and nine open spaces on the south side. Um, and 10 illegal, illegally parked cars on the south side, leaving 12 open spaces. So, I mean, I guess some of it depends on which day you're there, but it leads me into what your colleague, and I'm sorry I don't recall your name, said earlier about the shift changes um, in the submission. It said Cabrini um, was going to, would have to look into, I don't want to, how to balance the shift changes with the state health code. Because part of what I'm wondering is this does seem to be a product of shift changes. So if you could alternate shift changes or, you know, some people work 6 to 2, others work 7 to 3, because I understand the overlap that you have a nursing home and right. the and nurses can't leave before the next nurse comes in and, and checks it. I understand those safety considerations. But there seems like there could be a more pragmatic solution that wouldn't require a 25 parking spot lot in the front of, um, of the village abutting property to Broadway. So we did look at the shift changes and we did look at the staffing by hour throughout the day. And this is what was compiled by the client as their, based on their actual employees' counts on those peak hours. So they, they do peak out with approximately 210 employees during the uh, 11 or 12 o'clock hour. So that comes down to approximately 200, well actually, excuse me, 231. 231 employees during that peak hour that we're on the parking lot for, which is the four, four o'clock period, three, three or four o'clock period. So, yes, it does, on a daily basis, you will see variations. I don't deny that. We studied a two day period. Um, if you study a six month period, what is that going to change the result? Probably not. You're still going to need the additional parking, whether it's a two day period or a six month period. And, and as a comparison, you know, I think I mentioned previously, when you look at a roadway design, and you're at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, if you're sitting at an intersection and you look around and there's five lanes and they're all empty, does that mean that they're going to stay that way? No. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to find that every one of those lanes is occupied and there's backup on, on that particular intersection. So you design as traffic engineers and you design for that. Trustee Sullivan, you brought up a great point too. There were cars that were legally parked. Part of our submission and part of what the review has been done by Cabrini is looking at whether people are walking to work, looking at car sharing, looking at all the, the ways to help mitigate the proposal here. So this is not that this was looked at in a vacuum, that this was a simple need. There's been a number of ways that this has been looked at to try and help reduce other parking demands on the property. We looked at other similar situated facilities that have, in, in other municipalities and the adjoining communities that have significantly larger or more, uh, require more parking, let alone providing for more parking on the site. So what we're trying to do is, is, is ensure that those illegal uh, parking vehicles don't happen on the site. That helps the emergency first responders in the village get to the property and also ensures that the site operations work well 
all the flows better together essentially helps function the whole the whole site. I agree, but there were 10 illegal park cars today when there were 21 open spots on the lot. And I, Cabrini can call the police department to enforce the parking restrictions so that people learn that when you go to Cabrini, you better park in the open spots. It wasn't a product of not having spots. But I don't think my question about the balancing of shift changes so that we have less of a demand from three to four um, so that maybe there's less of a need for these excess parking spots was answered. I mean, it's on page, well, they're not numbered, but it's point one on your November 18th submission. Um, and if you don't have an answer today, that's fine, but I do think that that um, should be answered. I will have Ralph speak directly to that, but part of what this individual that went out to the site today, I don't know if they have an engineering or traffic background or, or parking study background, but I'm not sure how long they were there whether these vehicles parked illegally because all the spaces were taken, which goes directly to... No, I'm park. telling you, the, the spaces were open, but it's just, my point is it's anecdotal, and your parking study is anecdotal, but I'd, I'd rather have an answer to the other question now. Thank you. And so, I mean, what, what happens is that the people who are coming in are finding that they can't, they don't have a place to park, and they're parking illegally in other places. So as those people are already parked there, the secondary people that are in their spaces are already are leaving afterwards. So it's not like the employees can go back outside and move their cars to the legal spot. So that's what's happening is that overlap period, people are parked illegally, and as the shift changes, the people, are come, the people that are leaving their shift come out and move their cars out of the legal park spots, and that's how it's going to happen. But can we also say that maybe this, um, casual lack of parking has created a habit where people don't want to walk and rather than to actually park further on the back lot where there is a space is available, they rather park in the spot that is illegal that they already know that they get away with parking in there so that they don't have to walk far. There's so many different elements that they are substantial here. Um, at the same time, all of your data is only based on a two-day study, which I've been analyzing it and thinking about it since you presented to us, and I do have a concern about the fact that the study was only done in two days. I, I work in the hospitality industry. My data changes by the day of the week. My parking lot is empty on a Sunday while it's completely full on a Tuesday. So there's a lot of different elements that comes into play. So I have a concern that that two-day study doesn't necessarily really give you a full overview of the information that we need. I think what the board would like, and I'm just based upon the comments that we've heard today, is that we would like to do a more formal traffic study that's that more involved in two days. The difference between a traffic study and a parking study, are you asking for? I think I maybe would, I think a traffic study that's and a parking study. I'm independent. Patterns of traffic entering and exiting the site, not necessarily a I think it would be important for us to have validation of the parking study. And I think it would be important to know if there's um, an issue of traffic or more traffic or accommodating current traffic mm -hmm. coming in and out so that it makes sense for us to have our own consultant review the submissions to the technical submissions. <clears throat> well, I'd like to have our traffic consultant do actually the actual study. Yeah. So, because mm -hmm. um, you know, you're asking us to, you're, right now it's what, 11 acres of. We're asking for an, an as of right. Well, I understand it's as of right. <laughs> right, I understand uh, that, but here, right uh, now it's 11 here. acres of grass and trees, and they're asking us to let you, to have you dig it up, and with impervious service on a based upon a survey that's two days of two days of looking on a Wednesday and a Thursday. So I think to get the fuller picture of it, I, I think it would be more um, telling for all of us if we have a full traffic and parking study. I know that it's cost you already a lot of money for this, but I think for the benefit of the village and the benefit for all of us, if we have that study available, I think we can make a, a more informed yeah, I mean, decision. Traffic studies are typically generated, as, as you mentioned, when you're involved with new development, new proposals, expansion of programs, or other uses on the property. The applicant has significantly looked at other alternatives for parking. It's gone through excessive analysis for what is and oftentimes considered an exempt application for secret purposes. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're here providing a, a now a 3D model that I expect, at least from the board, can we get a temperature that, that visually this the, that what was presented tonight helps further the understanding that there is no visual impact here because we're trying to we're trying to move the, the ball ahead here. I think. Well, I don't know how you could say that there's no visual impact when you're walking down and you see cars instead of grass. It's not about just the river view. It's about 
greenery. I mean, and having open, you know more green space and one of our in Dobbs Ferry. Protect open spaces in Dobbs Ferry specifically in the <coughs> division <coughs> plan. It's so in the vision plan. plan, which is that's where I'm targeting a lot of my concerns. They are not aligned with the vision plan of the village. So before we make a decision, though, I think we, the, the studies would be good. I mean, are we okay with just the parking study, or do we? How do we feel? We want the whole traffic study done. What's everyone's feeling? I just need confirmation that the demand requires 25 spots. Seven so days a that would be and seven and, days. The, and that study? the alternatives that were proposed by the planning board and the con considered by Cabrini are, you know not feasible because they either don't provide enough parking spots or the cost really is what Cabrini has presented the cost to be. I think it would be important for us to have um, independent verification of that. Yeah, because there's also <clears throat> an issue with the parking because no part of there's some alternate side of the street as well. So I think the day for the week that, that the studies are being done are very important as well because there might be an instance where there may only be two days a week when you need extra spaces and we would just request some clarification about what ultimately the board is looking for because our traffic consultant has done it based on industry standards but if there are specific days of the week that the board is looking for that its consultant can review our report prior to providing it or going and doing additional studies all we're trying to find is just some guidance about what would be appropriate yeah, well, so well, I'll tell you, if our traffic consultant, I mean, if our parking consultant looked at your parking report and said, you know what, that's adequate two-day studies, and based upon the two-day studies, I concur with your report, if our consultant said that, then I think we'd be hard-pressed to say that it's not an adequate report. So if our, if our parking consultant said he would need to study a week or whatever that is, then we, of course we'd want to go with, with what his recommendations were. So we're not the experts, but we're happy to follow what the expert says. And if the expert says two days, Thursday and Wednesday, are fine to judge parking, then that would be fine. Okay. So that's what the, so I think we'll do that if, uh, and we'll adjourn it. Plus it has to go for the state to review, <coughs> right? Just to be clear, there's no involvement with the state with respect to the Right. We're not changing any, we're not modifying any entranceway or exit on the state highway. So the comment from the county and the GMO referral is not an accurate comment. There, there is no coordination with the county, the state DOT, with respect to uh, our parking plan. But they, they had concern about the stormwater. <coughs> yep. Well, but all I've addressed the stormwater, and we also, as I mentioned, uh, there are existing bike parking spaces uh, on, the, on the premises. I'm not sure that the county is aware of that, but we can certainly make them aware of that. But I'll have Rob touch on that. Charlie has something uh, specific there. there. Charlie. With regard to the stormwater. Uh, Hold on just a moment before we leave that topic. Go ahead, Charlie. There, there's a number of issues that we, I believe, have the right to uh, look at through our experts' lenses. And I think that's all we're asking for. And, and also, as to the DOT, they may not have uh, any issues with it, but they are obligated to look at it because of the Route 9. And Upon, wait, 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 wait. Upon the request of the county, I mean, the county planning board has been this, doing this for many years, and I, I think they do a pretty good job of it. If they believe that it should be sent there, I'm not saying that they're going to comment, then it should be sent there. And if they have no comment on it, I'm sure they'll answer that. We certainly don't have an objection to referring any documentation okay. whatsoever. Okay. Saying DOT has no jurisdictional review authority in this particular matter. If there's comments that would benefit the board, I, they may want to review right. the, the, the storm water drain Just issue. Okay. So, so I have one thing that, and I apologize, is I probably should have brought this up earlier. But it seems that it's common practice, Westchester County being an example, and actually the Dobbs Ferry Riverside Pavilion, the St. John's Hospital being an example, of the use of valets to manage peak parking so that cars can be double stacked and can be managed. And I, I was not at the site visit um, because I had a scheduling conflict, but is that something that's come up in this process or was that part of what was studied when you evaluated uh, parking alternatives? Better suited to um, be 
being applied to their patient's care than towards operational costs of the valet. That's one thing, but the valet is perpetual. You were saying that the valet is going to be there every day for the next absolutely ten years, hundred years. That that could but be an employee. That could be a position or? created. That could be a position created at Cabrini that will be a salary, not a daily expense. And again, we've looked at alternative parking analysis. We even looked at, there was a request that we look at off, uh, other alternative sites, which is not permissive in, in the village. We looked at other uh, alternatives with St. Christopher's, provided us correspondence saying, hey, there's concerns about having other uh, users of their property, let alone the, the unavailability that they have existing today uh, for their site. So we've done a number of other analyses. I saw the St. Christopher's, but what other ones are you talking about that are non-permissive uses in the village? There was a request that we, a request that we looked at off-site parking and, uh, and leasing parking and off-site facilities, which under the zoning code is not permissive, permissive because all parking related to a particular facility has to be on that parcel. I, 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 well, Mercy College yeah. leases parking in the village. Um, I don't think that's a violation of the code. I, I don't know, Lori Lee, whether well, you... Yeah, in, in this case, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And in this case, the, 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 it's the village board that determines how much parking is where and on the site or off the site. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, with, you're, you're not suggesting that they're moving an entire parking lot elsewhere. You're suggesting that for purposes of the overflow. Overflow. Oh, overflow. Yeah. Okay. So and, and all we're asking is that you... I'm sorry. And are you asking about valet during that peak period? Are you asking yeah, for just during the peak day? period. Because I, I recall that there's a significant drop in staff on the weekends because the the, um, the staffing for the OT and the PT, they're not there seven days a week. So right. I, I do recall that Saturday and Sundays, it might not be a problem, but your you know traffic consultant might be able to help mm -hmm. you with that. Okay. So I'm I... sorry, Laura. No, it's okay. I, I, just, I just really, you know, one you to understand that we are trying to understand your points of view and everything that you have presented to us, but we continue to look for alternatives to protect that green space. Uh, there, there are options that I would like you to invest time and money on in looking on the recommendations that they are being made by this board and by other entities of the village so that we can prove that there is other options instead of just keep looking as of the why not, we cannot do it. All I keep hearing is we cannot do this, we cannot do that. There hasn't been one open mind about looking into some of the alternatives that they have been presented by some of the other boards and recommendations that we have made. And I, if I may, like I we have been on referral to the planning board, so a lot of these questions and discussions and alternatives were considered and reviewed at length at those boards, and we did try to provide sort of a summarized uh, version of that. And in our in our submission, we did include references to again the modifications of this parking design so as to preserve the trees, based on questions and comments that came up during your site visit, and to make sure that what we're doing really tries to achieve all of those purposes. We hear you. I know the mayor requested that we look at this. Uh, and have a, a, your village's consultant review our uh, parking study. I think we're amenable to that purpose, and we'll certainly be sure to continue to try and address uh, these comments as they, they come forward again. You know, we went, we went forward with a very you know, extensive presentation tonight to try and help understand visually for those that either couldn't the benefit of the public or for those that weren't able to conduct uh, or to come out to the site for a site visit. We did put that together to try and be responsive to your comments and, and, and not only these comments, but those of the planning board that we've been addressing. For no, and I appreciate this has been going on for almost a year for you guys, and I know and I, you've done, and I appreciate the effort and time and money that you put into it, but it's a big decision and it's, it's, uh, it's something that we're trying to, um, you know, cause in the future, down to, in the village, it's, a, it's an issue for us. This is a, a public hearing. Is there anyone who wants to speak well, about? I, I did have to talk oh, yes, for a moment. Sure. Yeah. Oh. The county is not familiar with the on-site drainage system and their, their comment that this is a stormwater detention area is incorrect. The runoff from this existing uh, parking, the existing green space, enters a drain inlet, two drain inlets, one at this location and the existing drain inlet here. This, in, this stormwater uh, drain line contributes to a very large underground stormwater infiltration system at this location here. 
that infiltration system is several hundred feet of large diameter corrugated perforated pipe. So the stormwater infiltrates through this. So anything that we get out of this corner goes into this system, infiltrates into the subsoil. And the pipe, the overflow pipe from the system is only for at a high level. So the higher your storms and the, uh, the much more intense storms like the, you know, the severe downstorm, down, uh, uh, down, uh, yeah, down forwards, excuse me, are the ones that will discharge through a pipe that discharges down the hill. And that pipe connects to what's called a flume that is par running parallel to the Metro North tracks. Now that flume and that pipe were reviewed and approved by Metro North at the time of the prior of the construction of the system. So, that's cool. so the uh, county's not familiar with this, so their assumption was somewhat incorrect, and because of their infamiliarity with the system. Can you write that up for us? Sure. Well, okay. you have I to send that, that to the county, and you have to yeah. respond to that. Do you not? You will, but I yeah. respond to the brief. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's sure. Okay. Can and I, I think can I that. Just Wait, okay. wait, 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 wait. Clarification wait. on what you just said. This was designed when the original structure was built or when this most recent addition? Okay, thank you. Just wanted to. I'm not an expert, and I don't think any of us are. I think we do have our, our uh, consultants who need to review this and make sure that they're comfortable with the stormwater as well. Um, our engineers should be seeing that. Um, and you are replacing a, a permeable surface that they're right. with impermeable. Okay. If you go from grass to curb, it's a right. thing. I understand that. But they made a comment that it's a stormwater management area, which it is not. Yeah, I just think it's another thing that our, our engineers should be looking at and make sure that, that, um, that they're comfortable with it. Just so I'm clear about what I would like, I would like our consultant to look at the alternatives that Cabrini looked at and the explanation for the limited number of spots, the um, inability to, to fix the slope or the expense associated um, with doing those per, uh, changes so that we could have the proposed parking be in different areas, not at the front of the par uh, front of the building, um, so that we have an understanding as to that as well. Okay. And you got to go ahead. Go ahead. You want to talk? Rob Lane, 228 Judson Avenue. I'm representing the planning board, and I think I'll be brief because I think you all pretty much understand what our concerns are. Um, we're not suggesting that there may be a legitimate issue at certain times of the day, and we're sympathetic to that challenge. Uh, and I also want to point out that we're not singling out Cabrini in any way. As you all know, uh, Danforth, we pushed hard to have them reduce their parking ratios and provide a shuttle, which they did. Mercy College, approval of the new dormitory that's dependent on them implementing a traffic demand management plan, which they are doing. And I'm sure this will also be an issue with the pending development of Children's Village. The vision plan is both general and specific about this. On the general side, we talk about preserving open space and green space throughout the village, preserving buffers that adjoin the neighborhoods and to Broadway, and concern for the incremental degradation, including non-point source pollution from parking lots. But the vision plan, which is sometimes gets not to being too general, is actually very, very specific here. They talk about this location as being an important gateway to the village. It is listed, there's an inventory of open space resources, and this is listed on that because we do not make a distinction between public and private open space because we have so much institutional open space. It is part of the village character. And actually, in the case of the institutional campus reuse guidelines, it actually says Fort Cabrini to maintain a well-landscaped 50-foot setback from Broadway. So it's actually dimensionally specific to the plan. And of course, to promote non-auto commuting. The traffic committee, which does not support this application, has worked really hard on these issues with significant results. Thousands of hours of volunteer work have been done by the village committees, including the Environmental Commission. And the Climate Action Plan is committed to reducing traffic in the village. This committee regularly testifies for these kinds of measures throughout the village and for developments of every kind. Now, there are two ways to think about this, and both are in play. The first is for the additional parking to have find, keep the amount of, somehow find additional parking 
but do it in a way that has less impact on the environment and on the visual experience of driving into Dobbs Ferry. The second way of looking at it is to reduce the amount of car travel to Cabrini and hence through the village, and that is a more ambitious but more important outcome in some ways. We have made numerous visits to the site at different times of the day, including walkthroughs with by the building inspector and village engineer. Chairman Hunter and I have tracked utilization at different times of the day, and on most occasions we observed open spaces in various lots. There are often open spaces on Broadway, despite the alternative side of the street parking on Monday and Tuesday mornings, which does not overlap with the shift area. Again, I know it's not scientific, but I did exactly the same thing that your person did. I went to the site today at 315. There were 15 open spots on Broadway, 16 open spots on the, on the north lot, and 23 open spots on the, on the south lot. This leads us to believe that the real problems occur at certain peak moments related to shift changes, which is something that Green has also suggested is the case. This suggests that this is not so much a matter of space as it is a matter of management. We're not suggesting a single silver bullet solution. Rather, we believe that there's a menu of strategies that cumulatively can relieve this problem. As to the first approach about providing parking in other locations on and off-site, we think that there is an opportunity to exploit a few places where the lot can be expanded or reconfigured, including the handful of spots that could be built at the west edge of the site, although we don't agree with them about how many sites should be, could be created there. There are spaces underneath their port crochet, despite the cost to sprinkle that area, which is why those spaces have not been used. We think there are other opportunities to tighten up some of the striping and circulation, and to encourage staff to use the significant amount of off-street parking along Broadway. But because the idea is to reduce the total amount of driving in the village, there's a menu of so-called traffic demand management measures that should be tested over time. Among these, prioritizing spaces for carpools and van pools, pre-tax transit payroll benefits and or direct financial incentives to ride B-Line bus in Metro North, and other TDN techniques. Mercy has a program to pay people who will commit to carpool either $100 or $200 a semester, depending on how many people they get in those cars, and they have a guaranteed ride home program. To conclude, we're sympathetic to Cabrini's situation but we think that placing additional parking in the proposed location runs counter to many of the other stated goals in the village, including several specific provisions related to this property and division plan. And we would like to be satisfied that all the other mitigating strategies have been deployed for long enough time to see if they can be effective before paving more in that location. And to that, I just want to say, on this parking study that you're contemplating, which I support, it is not about going out and counting spaces. Any of us can do that. It is doing what we did at Mercy College, where we had a planner, who also was a traffic, had a traffic engineer in house, come up with a comprehensive plan where they could suggest what the impact is like and be over time with these other incentives. So I just want you to encourage, if you're thinking about this traffic study, think for a parking study, to think about it as a planning study and to have somebody who can talk about what the likely impact is going to be of these range of other traffic demand management. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Rob, can you give us a copy of that? I'm sorry? A, a copy of your statement? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? <laughs> Changed your mind? <laughs> no, just about this issue for now. Okay. Okay. I had two things I forgot. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, and this is maybe more for Lori Lee to speak on, but I noticed in the secret application that certain things might have been left out or not completely um, answered complete correctly. I don't recall Lori Lee. And then, you know, does it make sense here um, to have the long form secret application instead of the short form that they did here? They um, they did actually revise their EAF and your okay. submission package, and I sent you I. I refresh your memory this morning by sending you out the electronic version of the original package. So there is a revised short form. And this is an unlisted action, um, which is neither here nor there. And okay. it, it's always your prerogative to ask for a long form. If, if, if the reason you are looking at that is, is based upon an implication that there could be significant adverse environmental impacts that could only be shushed out with a long form. But um, I see that Taylor's up, so. <laughs> and, I, and 
If I may, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to cut Lloyd Lee off, but I, I, I would mention that here again, as an unlisted action, a short form is, is the appropriate form. And the applicant has also submitted what would be considered supplemental EAF support, which is the traffic to the parking report, the visual analysis. So all these details are really an extension uh, thereof of the EAF. So these details, while not saying EAF, um, are the specific criteria that would be otherwise considered uh, in that form as relevant to this particular application. So okay. we have submitted those additional details that would be appropriate. So Thanks. Yeah. Any, anything else you have? Just yes, I, I did want to ask, Does are there any other groups um, or entities that use the Cabrini parking lot other than Cabrini, its employees, and its visitors? I can ask uh, Pat if, yeah, I'll Pat, Pat, ask you to uh, that. <laughs> so let me just ask, do you mean routinely or occasionally? I guess you should answer it both. <laughs> okay. Um, routinely, no. Occasionally, yes. Okay. And by that I mean that different groups come in to do plays, performances, throw parties. Um, okay. Other than that, there's no difference. Um, if you may have seen a, a bus from Arch Care going in and out, we, we traded off our adult daycare program, which was uh, in our concourse level. We uh, no longer operate that. We traded it off with Arch Care for their adult daycare program, which is losing them space. So it's the same amount of employees, and their bus goes in and out with clients. What does that mean that you traded it out and they at least? Oh, that we don't run. We don't run the program. They're running the program. That's all. Okay. There, there's no difference. So if, if your question was because you're seeing an arch care bus, other than that, no. I mean, you know, groups come in and groups go. Um, as a matter of fact, we've been very restricted about having people come for seminars, you know, for workshops because we don't have parking for them except on weekends. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just uh, adjourn this to March 24th, to our meeting, and by then that should give us enough time to have our consultants look at it, okay? And we'll have our traffic consultant reach out directly to right. uh, Bill's Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm engineering. I'm sorry. No. No, yeah. I, I'm, no. A, I'm actually, are, are you discussing move, sending this back to your current engineer or are you looking for an actual traffic uh, we're going to send it to an actual traffic person okay so <coughs> i'm not sure that they've been appointed yet so we'll keep you in the loop no, so, and just so, so uh, contact lori lee oh and procedurally our, i believe the board has declared itself leading oh you're right That's we, have, we will do, do that, that yet. we uh, will do that sorry to jump again. <laughs> no it's okay Thank we should have done that a while ago but you're right yeah. we will do that the house, the housekeeping sorry we're going to do no. no. Oh, we did it for a different one. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave this open, right? If you've announced a date, certainly, I have. that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I will say the 3D was helpful. So yes. I appreciate it. Thank you. Regardless of if you attended the site visit or not. The 3D would be useful. Yeah. For all. Yeah. If anyone else doesn't want to come to the site, please let us know. So we can make it available. And I think Rob, we still have the market. It should be. We still run the market up for. Okay, and Ra Ralph, that um, stormwater management uh, design that you showed on the screen, is that in your materials? Is it, a, yes. is it attachment to your stormwater management report? Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's on the design sure. drawing. The stormwater management plan is detailed. Yeah. Plan okay. I just want to make sure that we have all the documents. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Are you able to send us that presentation that you just shared with us? Are you able to share that presentation that you just the, show us? The, the uh, 3D? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe so. I'll just have to uh, figure out a way to get it to you. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be great if you can do that. Thank you. And we'll also submit the, uh, the, I guess it's the diagram that we presented that shows the different times so that it's also part of the record. But I'll make sure you have that included. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving now to the courtesy of the floor. I'd appreciate it if you kept your comments to three minutes. And um, who will be first? Come on up. Please state your name and your address for the record. Hi, my name is Julie Fisher, and I live at 22 Hilldale Road. I recently learned about a bill introduced by 
by Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins to authorize the Village of Dobbs Ferry to reduce the speed limit to 20 miles per hour on village roads. I'm here this evening, among other community members, to request that our village officials strongly support these efforts. My husband and I moved to Dobbs Ferry 17 years ago. Coming from the city, a significant factor in choosing the location of our home was the accessibility for walking to and from the downtown area and our schools. Many fellow residents have decided to make Dobbs Ferry their home based on the attraction to a walkable, bikeable community. I never imagined that walking, even in clearly marked crosswalks, would start to seem more dangerous than driving around our small village. It hadn't occurred to me that one day my 16-year-old daughter would become a witness to a deadly hit and run while walking to a party with friends after a football game. Sadly, the accident my daughter witnessed involving the late Mr. DiPaolo was the third pedestrian fatality our community has experienced since 2014. In 2019 alone, there were at least 13 fatal pedestrian crashes across the lower Hudson Valley. Now, there's no doubt that distracted driving has played a large role in these accidents, especially considering the significant increase of fatal pedestrian crashes in the U.S. since 2009, when cell phones really first became commonplace. More large SUVs on the road also plays a role. That being said, a real factor that determines if someone lives or dies in a pedestrian-related crash is not necessarily the cause of the accident, but rather the speed at which the car is driving. Studies have shown that a pedestrian hit by a vehicle driving at 40 miles per hour will have an 80% likelihood of being killed in the accident. That's eight people out of 10 dying after being hit at 40 miles per hour. At 30 miles per hour, this improves slightly with four pedestrian crashes out of 10 resulting in a fatality. The best odds by far are when a car is traveling at 20 miles per hour. At this speed, the fatality risk drops dramatically to only 10% or one person out of 10 be losing their life. So whether the accident is caused by a distracted driver, a distracted pedestrian, a poorly lit intersection, or any other circumstance, the speed of the car will most often dictate the severity of the injury. In our village, we could save lives by implementing and enforcing 20 mile per hour zones at high pedestrian traffic areas, such as the middle school, high school zone of Broadway, Maple, Belton, and Washington, around Springhurst near Walgrove and Bellwood, at Clinton Avenue, as well as other additional streets that have no sidewalks and heavy pedestrian traffic. While I can only speak for myself, of course, I do want to point out we do have others here in attendance who are also in support of this legislation. Thank you for your continued efforts to make the streets of Dobbs Ferry safer for all and for your consideration of the support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Can you give that to <coughs> Liz? Liz? Um, I, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. And this is, this is um, just a study that I met. Yeah. Would you like to keep this? Yes, sir.
and as recently as September, as excuse me, as recently as September 2019, we lost Mr. DePaulo to traffic violence. In our neighboring villages of Irvington and Hastings, the speed limits on streets near schools are 15 miles per hour. So our neighboring villages, they've made this commitment, and we can too. It's very simple, as Julie just said, the chance of survival from a crash is drastically lower when speeds exceed 20 miles per hour. We also have wide local support for this bill, and it was notably initiated by the state Senate Majority Leader herself. We also have support for this bill from the Traffic Committee, so thank you, Donna, the PTSA Executive Committee, the PTSA Safe Routes Committee, thanks to Teresa and Betsy, um, neighborhood groups on Walgrove and Bellwood, the Maple Belden Washington neighborhood, and Clinton Avenue residents. It's worth saying, too, that at the end of the day, these are just signs. Beyond the simple step we are taking today, hopefully, there are four to five really glaring death traps in Dobbs Ferry right now. These include all of the crosswalks on Broadway without a dedicated stoplight and the crosswalk at Ashford and Storm. It's been proven that the best way to slow down cars is to do two things, and that's number one, to redefine our mission around transportation in Dallas Ferry, and that's to prioritize human life over moving cars quickly from one point to another. And number two, to design our roadways for lower speeds with this mission in mind. And this includes raising crosswalks, narrowing roads, removing lanes, shortening crosswalks, and creating buffers like street gardens or street trees between sidewalks and roadways. And I'm so happy to share resources with all of you. I know, Vinny, you have one of I do have your books. book, which I do have to return to you. But. <laughs> Let me just say what we're planning on doing is having a work session to address this issue. So I don't know what date we will plan this to be for, but we do want to have set aside some time just to address this bill and the issues that it, arise, that it raises. So um, it's a uh, very important matter. It's a very important issue. We want to give it the, the time that it deserves. So we will put that out, so please be sure to look uh, for future agendas so that you can attend the public workshop session on this and we can discuss it. Um, be that as it may, I know you have something else, so go ahead. Rosenberg and I'm stuck. Don't be the fourth. 
well, it was pretty dark, but I decided I'd put it up in front of my house and my backyard because I live on the way to Springhurst. There's a lot of speeding there. During the 2018-2019 school year, five children were hit by cars in Dobbs Ferry. Five. One man was fatally killed in September. I think it's safe to say that we have a problem in Dobbs Ferry. And I think everyone's kind of agreeing. Like, could we just raise our hands if we agree? Yeah, we have a problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, come <laughs> on, you know there is one. So as an elementary school teacher and a librarian, a lot of times I ask my students, what do we do with a problem? How can we work together to solve it? And as a librarian, I say that you can almost always find the answer in a book. So in 2016, a book came out that was so inspiring, I actually read it to all 600 of my students. So I'm going to ask you to just pretend you're in grade school for about two minutes and see if this book can help us solve this problem tonight. And it's called, What Do You Do With a Problem? I'll read it fast. Very I don't know fast. how it happened, but one day I had a problem. I didn't really want it. I didn't ask for it. I really didn't like having a problem, but it was there. This little boy has a teeny little problem. Why is it here? What does it want? What do you do with a problem? I thought. I wanted to make it go away. I shoot it, scowled at it, and tried ignoring it, but nothing worked. I started to worry about my problem. What if it swallows me up? It's getting bigger. What if my problem sneaks up and gets me? What if it takes away all of my things? I worried a lot. I worried about what would happen. I worried about what could happen. I worried about this and I worried about that. And the more I worried, the bigger my problem became. I wished it would just disappear. I tried everything I could to hide from it. I even found ways to disguise myself, but it still found me. And now it's huge. And the more I avoided my problem, the more I saw it everywhere. I thought about it all the time. I didn't feel good at all. I couldn't take it anymore. This has to stop, I declared. Maybe I was making my problem bigger and scarier than it actually was. After all, my, had, my problem had it really swallowed me up or attacked me. I realized I had to face it. So here he is getting ready to face the problem. So even though I didn't want to, even though I was really afraid, I got ready and I tackled my problem. And when I got face to face with it, I discovered something. My problem wasn't what I thought it was. I discovered it had something beautiful inside. My problem held an opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to learn and grow, to be brave, and to do something. So now he's feeling a little differently about the situation. All right, some new books. Pages are sticking up. It showed me that it was important to look closely because some opportunities only come once. So now I see problems differently. I'm not afraid of them anymore because I know their secrets. Every problem has an opportunity for something good. You just have to look for it. You can And this copy is for you guys. Well, that's a first. I have to say that we've never been ready to stay before, so thank you. <laughs> so, Dobbs Berry, how can we turn our problem into an opportunity? So, but your time is up. Okay. Can you submit that? Like one paragraph. Okay, one paragraph. Okay. Looking beyond this bill, it's imperative to speak openly and regularly about making our streets safer starting with those with heavy traffic and roads where children are walking to school. And also, last week in the Enterprise, the Hastings PTSA Traffic Safety Committee, Marisa Gonzalez Silverstein, endorsed a candidate, Georgia Lynn Hall, for trustee <coughs> because of the progress made in Hastings around traffic and their schools. She said for the past few years, they've been meeting monthly with Ms. Lynn Hall, as well as officers from the school district to make sure that children get to and from school safe. So I propose, you know, we do something like that here in Dobbs Spirit. And so here's all my things, and then I also have some other little presents for you, oh, sorry, of the rally, and of all the students <coughs> all together. Really nice, right? Six minutes. Donna, here, you want this one? <laughs> okay. And then I'll give you guys the kids, and the book, and the article, and the Thank speech. you. Thank you. Thank sorry, you. Of course, we get gifts. <laughs> Can't accept gifts.
We had accept gifts. <laughs> We'll, we'll, put, we'll put it in the in Village Hall. Gifts for the village. Okay. We'll get to the Village Hall. Not the go, individual. Go ahead. Thank you. It's hard to follow on, Lauren. Uh, <laughs> my name is Brianne Lusick, and I live at 21 Bellwood Avenue with my husband. And you can lower the mic. Can you say your name again? I'm sorry. Brianne Lusick, 21 Bellwood Avenue with my husband and uh, two daughters. Um, I have here a letter uh, from uh, Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner, who couldn't be here tonight, but asked me to read this letter, so I'll read it in a to. Dear Mr. Mayor and members of the board, I understand that your board is considering a resolution endorsing proposed state legislation introduced by New York State Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins that would reduce speed limits on certain roads and jobs ferried from 25 to 20 miles per hour. If this bill passes, the village would be able to reduce speed limits on roads with heavy pedestrian traffic and on roads near schools. I enthusiastically support this proposal. Pedestrian safety is an important concern. In the unincorporated section of Greenberg, we have recently experienced nine separate pedestrian safety accidents and four separate fatalities. These accidents occurred since August of last year. Last year, there was a fatality in Dobbs Ferry. A few years back, another fatality in Dobbs Ferry. There is an increase nationally in the number of pedestrian-related accidents. Greenberg and Dobbs Ferry are not alone. The proposed resolution will make our streets safer for pedestrians and children and will send a strong message to motorists to be more careful. I look forward to working with the village and learning from your experiences. There is nothing more important than safety. One final thought. Approving this proposal will also send an important message to the student activists who participated in and organized the rally last year that their voice and opinion counts and that government listens. Today's students may become tomorrow's future governors, senators, local officials. The enactment of this law will highlight their effectiveness. Sincerely, Paul J. Feiners, town supervisor. Thank you. Anybody else? Sure. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. I'm sure no one is against this bill. It gives the freedom to our town to make the decision about what we think is right for our streets. So I don't think there's a problem with us passing this, and I think it's going to get enacted. I'm going to the next step, where you're actually making those decisions about which roads are important enough to think through more clearly. We had this traffic study done on Clinton Avenue a little over a year ago, and it was done at a time when the master school was not in session, and it was done at a time which showed us that the speed limit on my road at 25, um, the traffic that was on that road, which is about 80 to 90 cars periodically, didn't speed enough, that they were not speeding fast enough to require any active measures beyond what was done recently, which was a flashing light and some gaps in the middle of the median. So my question here, my thought is to really encourage you to consider Clinton Avenue as one of those streets when this bill does get passed to, uh, I'm sorry, the law does get enacted to allow us to really consider what else we can do for my road. I currently don't have a, a lamp post on my front lawn, which used to be there, because someone ran over it, and thankfully I didn't have a car in my driver or children around, because it was taken across my yard and into the neighbors. We also have a fire hydrant that was removed, because somebody ran into it, and it was replaced with another part of the street. So if cars are hitting fixtures, imagine what they're doing if there's children or, car or others around. We have bus stops, we have children walking up and down, myself included. I just want to encourage you to consider Clinton Avenue a very serious thoroughfare that requires the same attention as all the other closer to public schools, not just the private schools. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Fluger on 11 Overlook Road. And I also represent a large group of neighbors, in my case around Price Street. Um, we're also worried about the safety for pedestrians, for our children, and for ourselves in our neighborhood. For those of you who are not familiar, um, Price Street runs parallel to Ogden Avenue. And the nice thing about our neighborhood is we could walk places. We can walk to Springhurst, we can walk to the Rivertown Square, we can walk to stores on Ashford Avenue and to Gould Park now with the new pool, but even adults don't feel safe walking on Price Street. So what are our concerns? Price Street has over time become one of the major through fairs, so drivers are using it to cut through our neighborhood. 
we see a lot of distracted driving, lots of speeding, and just in general, an increase of traffic. So why is that? We have observed two significant patterns. The one is that everyone and their brother wants to avoid Ashford Avenue. So in order to do that, many people going between downtown and the Artley Bridge use the favorite Beacon Hill, Price Street, Hickory Hill shortcut to come through our neighborhood. The other major group that's cutting via Price is going to and from the River Town Square development. Now I know when Rivertown was built, everyone was worried that Ogden Avenue would become one of those major through fares, but Ogden Avenue now has speed bumps, stop signs, a traffic line, a parking lane, and two very wide shoulders. So Ogden's not very attractive to cut through, but pa Price Street goes exactly in parallel, and it has none of those measures. We do not even have a sign that says 24 miles per hour, we have no sidewalk, it's just an open, wide, unobstructed street, and unfortunately it's very ideal for speeding and drivers take advantage of that. With no sidewalks, as everywhere, this is really dangerous for pedestrians, and it's also on the route of a school bus. So we've brought those concerns to the traffic committee in January, and we have been really grateful that they have been such an amazing resource on this mission for us. So we're thankful for their support and ongoing partnership. Also, since we brought this um, to the traffic committee, the police has increased their presence. They even put this mobile electronic speed sign up on Price Street for a week. So we were really appreciative of the fact that there was such a fast and immediate response to our concerns. Now, when it comes for a solution, we all know that sidewalks come with complexities. They cost money, they require homeowner approval. So while we would love to have sidewalks on our streets, um, we are aware kind of of the practical reality here. Um, but we do believe there's many measures that we could take to significantly improve the pedestrian safety on Price Street. We want to continue to work with the traffic committee and then come back here to present our ideas for a solution. <coughs> Tonight, we merely wanted to bring this other area and this other neighborhood to your attention, kind of in the theme that we're having here. And we're asking for your ideas and input as we go along the journey for particular this Chestnut neighborhood. It is in the vision plan for the Chestnut neighborhood to be better connected to other neighborhoods. So we're fully aligned with that. And then, of course, we ask for your support um, to make Chestnut Ridge safer for pedestrians. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, my name is Lee Gross. I'm with the, the, the female division. And uh, on January 6th, my daughter, I was to pick up my daughter from middle school. She's 13 years old, and we don't let her cross Broadway there because it's not safe. She was on one side of of the Broadway on the school side, and I was on the other side with my dog, waiting for the traffic to stop. There is a a sign that says that you know to allow pedestrians to cross for cars to stop. Five cars went through. I finally stepped out a little bit into the street, and a car came and hit my dog. The dog was pinned under the wheels. I had to get the car to back up to free my dog. My daughter was on the other side witnessing this whole thing. And um, the dog is, is, is recuperating now. It, it, it wasn't a fake, fatal accident. But uh, the point is, people don't stop at these signs. And, and in a place as obvious as in front of the high school, I think that we, we need either flashing lights. If the police came over, they suggested that we put flashing lights there or have a button or something that's similar to on Clinton. But, it is, this is a real major problem here. People do not stop at crosswalks. And uh, just coming over here tonight, my wife and I witnessed almost 10 cars went by without stopping at the crosswalk. And Thank you. I know that you all know this is a problem, but I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thanks. Just Thank so you. you know, we all 
as you know, Broadway is a state road, which comes with all sorts of complications and bureaucracy we have to jump to. We are in the process of trying to get um, those rapid flashing lights on certain crosswalks on Broadway, but it might take time, but we are working on that. Anybody else? I just have to add that I'm glad that you're using the crossroads. I recently watched a um, report from Westchester County where the county is actually implementing a uh, mo momentum to actually train pedestrians to use the crossroad. And there was actually an article um, that was recently uh, shared as a report where a police officer via a camera was actually showcasing on Channel 12 <coughs> how pedestrians just cross right across um, from the crossroads and they are not using um, the crossroads. And I really think that anything that we do should also include, and I think that I shared that with you when we had our conversation, is an education to a lot of our pedestrians to use the crossroads. I have witnessed people going across our gateway from to Ashford straight to um, the church or from one gas station to the other, and it blows my mind because I will never feel safe doing it. So it's just something that I think that we have to also take in consideration. That was your stuff that is not mine. Um, but I, I, I'm glad that, that you say that you're using the crossroads, and yes, it is a serious concern that we have because people don't stop, but I'm so glad that you're using it. So it's a big issue, and we want to spend a lot of time on it, give it the seriousness that it deserves. So we will spend, we will put on a, a work session where we can talk about all the options and bringing all experts on this to discuss it. So I appreciate everybody coming in today. Um, look in the agendas for the future meetings, and um, thank you for coming in. Anybody else want to speak about anything else at all? Okay, so we can move on to our other meeting. You guys are all welcome to stay for that other stuff. <laughs> Come on, it's just about to get fun. <laughs> we get to I'm sorry, I didn't give you this picture. And this is the one in Hastings with Baden. I took a picture with that. 15. Okay, so that's what I like to see. Yeah. I think that's the school but, but zone. The 20 miles an hour site in Hastings, there are some. It's a school zone, but we don't even have that at Springhurst. So yeah, there's a 15, there's suggested 15 mile per hour sites on Springhurst. No, in, in the road to enter Springhurst, it is 15 miles an hour. Yeah. yeah. We're in a public meeting, meeting we should be having a Right, so let's yeah. yeah. go. So Thank we hope you. that you thanks. joined us when we okay. actually have this open for okay. discussion. Oh, I okay. definitely want to. Thank you okay, so thanks. much for doing that. Thank Here's you. this in case it helps with any other problems. Thank you. Now. Okay. Okay. We can't. All right. We can't do this. Okay. We, we cannot do this. We cannot do this now. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Okay. Can we, let's move along. You can speak at the mic if you like. You're more than welcome to speak, speak on the, the mic, mic if you yeah. want to make your statement. Yeah. But it has to be on the record. Okay, I'd like, to I'd like to consider a motion to approve audits three, numbers three, number four, number five for February 2020, as recommended by the village treasurer. Is there a motion? Trustee okay. Taylor, seconded. Trustee Nell, all in favor? That passes seven to zero. <clears throat> Consider a motion to appoint Ms. Allison Schultz as member of the traffic committee for a term of one year as recommended by the nominating committee. Is there a motion? Trustee Nell, second. Deputy Mayor Cassell, all in favor? That passes 7-0. Consider a motion to accept Mr. Michael Novak as member of the Dobbs Terry Volunteer Fire Department, Livingston Hose Company, and to have his name placed onto the active insurance rolls as recommended by the Dobbs Ferry Fire Department Board of Wardens. Is there a motion? Trustee Taylor, second. Trustee DeRazi, all in favor? That passes 7-0. Consider a resolution in connection with the proposed amendment to the site plan for 115 Broadway Cabrini, establishing the board as lead agency on the CICRA. Now, I don't know if we should have done this earlier. It really doesn't really matter, I guess. Uh, no, this is uh, before you can reach a decision on the matter. Um, and seeker regulations suggest you do this as early as possible in the process, but it has been overlooked 
So this is just housekeeping at this point. You're declaring yourselves as lead agency. You are the only approval authority, so there's no need to circulate a notice of intent. There's no, you're, you're the only approval authority, so there really isn't another option. So you'll declare yourselves as lead agency, um, as was suggested by the consultant's attorney. The, okay. The consulting attorney. Is there a motion for this? Uh, Deputy Mayor Casal, second, Trustee Taylor, all in favor? That passes 7-0. Referral from the building official for the board to set a public hearing for final review of 100 Main Street addition renovation on March 24th, 2020. Um, do I have to have a motion for this, or am I just setting a date? Well, you, you do need to set a date, and you can only do that by official action. Okay, so is there a motion to set a public hearing for the review of 100 Main Street? Wait, we have this. And we, it's going to be two, yes. Okay. The, this ain't Ivis Cedar. And this. Right. And Cabrini. This and Cabrini. This and Cabrini. No, I'm not saying this. I'm saying Cabrini, Cedar, and... Is Cedar Maine. going to be on March 20th? <coughs> oh, oh, we lock. moved them. Did we, we did move them. We cannot. They're on the first. Those three. They're on March 10th. You're on March They're, They're on March 10th. 10th. Yeah, with the, to be with the local law. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be continued, I guess. Okay. Well, I don't think you can put it off any further. Okay. Just putting it out. Is there a motion? <laughs> Trustee Patino, second. Trustee Sullivan, all in favor? That passes 7-0. And I'm going, we're going to set a public hearing date, not for March 24th, <laughs> Thank God. set a public hearing date for establishment of the sewer fund law. And Charlene, can you talk about this, please? Sure. Um, there has, as you know, our, our sewers are aging quickly. Um, and as I've been told and has been looked at, it's great when the sewers are doing fine. It's not a sexy subject, but when the sewers are not doing fine, that's a problem. Um, so we're looking in the budget program, like Jeff and I have talked a, a great deal about this, um, of a way of funding this without it being solely on the residential property. As you know, we have a 60-40% split. 60% of our um, residences are taxed and 40% are exempt from all taxes except for the county tax for sewage treatment plan. This method of making a sewer fund would take it out of the general budget, place it into what is called an enterprise fund, so that we may track our costs, have the engineering fund uh, uh, out of that, uh, because we need an engineering study to see how bad um, the sewer issues are. Um, it would be uh, the ability to capital plan we could have capital plans for what we need after we do the engineering report. So the point is, is that these costs will be distributed over 100% of the properties based on usage. Therefore, the resident, small little average household, at this point, because we're still playing with the numbers to see what's needed and what the usage is, will be around maybe $108, $110 a year. Those that have much more usage, whether it be exempt or non-exempt, will pay more. Thus, really uh, lessening the burden on the people who pay the property taxes at this point. It's not a property tax issue. It is a usage issue. It is the sewers are used by everyone. And we are allowed by, um, by law to set up this fund. Hastings and Ardsley are in the same position and have decided the same thing. We may do it at different levels. I know Ardsley is doing it uh, in tandem with us. In fact, they, are, they already passed. They already set the public hearing. Um, this has been an issue with the board. The board has tried to relieve the pressure from homeowners. Um, and yet, Q 
keep the quality of life, and sewers are a quality of life, even though you don't see them, <laughs> um, in a good working uh, manner. So we ask that you set the public hearing for the sewer fund for March 10th. We will have much more information by that time. Um, and I think it would be a benefit for the village to share the responsibility of an aging system, basically. Okay, thank you for that explanation. There's something new and different, uh, but it's important. So, um, is there is there a resolution <coughs> in the packet, yeah, setting March 10th as the, as the night to discuss the local law that will establish the sewer fund and um, the sewer fee program. Okay, so is there a motion to um, set a public hearing date for the, sta <coughs> for the establishment of a sewer fund law? That's uh, Trustee uh, Taylor, second Trustee Nell, all in favor? And that passes. So. Okay, um, the minutes, does anybody have any um, questions or comments about the minutes? Um, yes, there's a typo on page 15, it's missing an E in there. And then I, think I was present for the end of the meeting. So I think I was part of the motion. Okay. And I'm sure I voted to approve the conclusion of the meeting. <laughs> so is there a motion to accept the minutes as amended um, by Trustee Sullivan? Trustee Cassell, well, uh, seconded by Trustee Sullivan, all in favor? So that adopts the minutes. Um, reports and announcements. Do you have any reports or announcements, Trustee DeRozzi? Just want to share with the community that uh, the DPW, um, I call the DPW because uh, that has become my adjacent to the uh, beautification committee. We are ready to start our planning for the planting for the spring, so we welcome anyone that would like to volunteer. Um, we are really welcoming people, so please, um, following Christine Nails, uh, Trustee Nails that is going to speak about the nominating committee. Uh, if anybody's interested in volunteering and assisting us on this 2020 spring um, spread for the beautification of the village, um, please come on board and join us. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Patino, do you have anything? Not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Sullivan? No, I think you all have all the library updates as you seem to every week. So I, I do not have any. Oh, I did notice that the library is doing a screening of Parasite, but I don't recall when. So I suggest you go to, everyone go to well, the... Well, that's an excellent movie, so... Are we yes, I that? think it's a screening on, I want to say... Well, come back to me, I'll tell you when it is. Okay, I'll come back to you. Trustee now? No Nothing. Well, that's difficult. I, I just want to uh, say quickly that the uh, meetings on um, the passive heating, the heat smart that the sustainability task force did, at least the one I attended in the library, it's standing room only. Yes. It's still possible to get involved. It's a great thing to think about, a way to save energy, save money. Um, it doesn't work everywhere, but it, it's a great possibility that people should take advantage of. That was well attended. Mm -hmm. um, Deputy Mayor Casal. Yeah, uh, the CAV just let know is working on uh, finalizing a new open space inventory, which they'll be submitting once the board approves it to the uh, to Westchester County. Um, and the Affordable Housing Task Force is working on a presentation for the board um, regarding um, the the. Um, Affordable has the Westchester County needs assessment and on what the Affordable Housing Committee is, is doing. Uh, I think there was another, oh yes, CAB, again, big one, uh, is in the process of working with Mercy College um, and uh, who has offered one of their um, programs. Um, they will be coordinating water testing, water quality testing for Wickers Creek. So uh, they'll be happening in the spring. So I keep our fingers crossed that that will all go through because that would be a great thing for the village and for our uh, friends of the Wicca's Creek. Yes, yeah, certainly would. Appreciative of that. I have a few. Um, on Tuesday, April 7th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Westchester County Clerk Tim Idoni's mobile office will be at Village Hall, parked on Main Street in front of the police department. Um, the AARP income tax aid will be happening Mondays, I guess starting now, Mondays through April 13th 
at the library from 12.30 to 4.30, it's every Monday. And Rivertown Pollinator Forum, learn about five local pollinator projects and how you can support pollinators in your own garden. That's February 27th, it's Thursday at 7.30 at South Presbyterian Church. And the um, Dobbs Ferry Recreation Department is hiring for the summer and they're looking for all types of um, people to work as lifeguards, day camp counselors, CITs, WSIs. What's a WSI? Is Water know? safety instructor. Thank uh -huh. you. Okay. <laughs> they can uh, teach uh, the swim lessons at camp and stuff. Okay, for, so some of these jobs are for kids 14, as young as 14. So if you're interested, go to the uh, Dobbs Ferry um, Recreation website. And or you can call 914-693-0024 for an application. So um, I guess that's it. We are going to adjourn to. Oh, I just wanted to say one. I, I don't. I couldn't find that, but that's what I thought. Dobbsferrylibrary.org is good, but I did want to comment that Vinny and I had attended the memorial that the library did for Cheryl Matthews. So did Maura. Maura was there. Sorry, and Maura. I apologize. Sorry, you came in later than us, though. So. <laughs> um, but you were there for the start, so it's okay. <laughs> But um, anyway, it was really well done. Um, I didn't realize that she literally had never had any other job um, and had been there for 43 years. So since 47. she was 47. 47. I shouldn't be doing this enough, but somebody else should. <laughs> but um, it was so well done. I mean, I cried during it. Her family was very prophetic. The slideshow, the library did a fantastic job honoring somebody who had been a treasure to the village and many students currently, uh, parents, grandparents who also um, had her as their librarian, so it was a it's a videotape and it's been posted on Facebook and somewhere else. And so, if anyone's interested, it was it was really nice. No, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I have to really give kudos to everyone that was involved. It was such a beautiful memorial to her life, and it was just very well done. And they, they just did a fantastic job. It was very moving. It's just to show you how one person could affect so many other people. So, uh, okay. On that note, I will adjourn. Take a motion to adjourn. I the have meeting. to take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Trustee Taylor, second. Trustee Sullivan. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned.